Rex Tillerson's first visit to Afghanistan this week was cloaked in secrecy. It lasted less than three hours, but it allowed the US Secretary of State to meet with Afghan President Ashraf Ghani. While footage shows they were at Bagram Air Base, Ghani's office released this photo, which edited out the alarm and military clock, making it less obvious where they met. But Tillerson's message about the US strategy in Afghanistan was explicit. Well, the President's made it clear that you know, we're here to stay until we can secure a process of reconciliation and peace. Clearly, we have to continue the fight against the Taliban and against others in order for them to understand they will never win a military victory. These Afghan National Army commandos are training to take out the Taliban. And in this exercise in Kabul, they accomplish their mission. Training and retaining members of the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces is a core part of the strategy to stop a resurgent Taliban. But there are problems with getting them to the front lines. A new report found that in 2016, the percentage of Afghan trainees who went AWOL from US-based training doubled from the historical average of 6 to 7% to 13%. It says the AWOL rate is likely to either remain steady or increase. It found the most common reasons for deserting were personal and family safety concerns and a perceived job insecurity in Afghanistan following training, because they're not guaranteed employment when they return. The US and its coalition partners have spent billions of dollars on training and building up the Afghan security forces. The Afghans who do serve are in one of the most dangerous professions. Between January and May this year, 2,531 service members were killed in action and 4,238 were wounded. In the last two weeks, a bus carrying military cadets in Kabul was ambushed by the Taliban. 15 trainees died. With security personnel coming under increasing attack while others desert, improving morale for the long fight ahead could prove to be one of the most important tactics in bringing peace to Afghanistan. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Joining me now from Kabul is Javid Faisal. He's the deputy spokesman for the chief executive of Afghanistan. From Vermont, we have Peter Galbraith. He's a former UN deputy representative to Afghanistan. And in Washington, Omar Samad. He's a former Afghan ambassador to Canada, France, and Belgium. Gentlemen, thank you all for joining us here on The Newsmakers. Javid Faisal, let's begin with you. Uh, the latest numbers show that 13% of the trained Afghan personnel are going missing. How serious of a problem is this? Um, I don't believe the numbers we have are uh, correct. Uh, um, what I heard earlier was about 10 percent, and that's also the number of those who are getting trained out of Afghanistan. Uh, if we bring all of that together, it doesn't make even uh, 5 percent of the whole of our national security and defense forces, which are crossing 350,000 uh, as of yet. Uh, that, that's not the right thing. But at the same time, uh, it is a problem, even if it's in the lowest level possible, it's a problem and it's something that we are looking into to make sure uh, that our forces um, uh, are no longer facing such problems that they are facing today. All right, Omar Samad, a uh, little bit of a inconsistency with the numbers, but uh, still hundreds of not showing up on their post. How is this affecting the country's fight against the Taliban? Uh, this has been a trend from the very beginning where you have a certain level of attrition and people not showing up for work or leaving for whatever reason. It's obviously a bit more problematic when you are talking about Afghan officers uh, at higher levels who are being trained overseas and who go AWOL. I think that in that case, uh, we need to take this issue very seriously. We need to uh, find ways to uh, do better vetting, uh, as well as make sure that there are some conditionalities put on anyone going overseas for, uh, for any type of training or education purposes uh, to make sure that they do come back and serve. Now, there are probably certain uh, extenuating circumstances under which uh, some people probably will not or cannot go back. But 
Having said this, it does have an impact on morale to some extent. I think that uh, it's one factor, not uh, a major one. Uh, but uh, the whole strategy of the United States, Afghanistan, NATO, and those who are helping Afghanistan and have helped Afghanistan over the years is to rely on the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. And that means that the fight against the enemy, as well as the protection of the Afghan population, rests on the shoulders of these forces. And these forces, on one hand, have done well. On the other hand, are still continuing to face some challenges challenges and will continue to need assistance from the international community. Peter Gabraith, uh, what does the U.S. think of all this? Uh, having spent billions of dollars in this campaign, it's America's longest war. Will it somehow reconsider, reevaluate this entire training program? I think the problem does, is not with the training program. And the, the problem with the Afghan National Security Forces is probably the, the least of the problems. The, the, the problem is with the broader strategy, which is a counterinsurgency strategy. So the, the way it worked when the, there were a large number of troops there, uh, the um, NATO forces would uh, clear an area, and they could do that fairly effectively. Then the Afghan National Security Forces would come in to hold the area. Uh, and now the Afghan National Security Forces with uh, uh, Western advisors, NATO advisors, are doing both the clearing and the holding. But it's the next part of the, of the process. The theory then is that you uh, would bring in local police, uh, police who would provide law and order. You bring in uh, administration to provide honest governance. Then the economy would grow. And the population, uh, the least committed insurgents would come over to your side. The middle committed insurgents would uh, 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 you know, sort of lay low. And then the population would turn in the, the uh, extremists. But it, the problem has been in the, in the latter part of the strategy. They've, they've been unable to provide uh, uh, honest administration, unable to provide effective policing. And the, the, uh, you know, a lot of the local officials, people who are in or out of power, in fact, are also in contact with the Taliban. We, we think of it in the United States as if there were two sides. But in fact, uh, it's not always that way. Uh, you have to think of the the whole thing is a bit like the mafia in Sicily in the 1970s, where the police and the local authorities were also in league with the mafia, even as they seemed to be at war with them. Javid Faisal, your response to that? Because many of these Afghans are signing up to become military servicemen, or as well as police, uh, simply because there aren't enough jobs out there. So why aren't they taking their positions? Uh, l l let me start as from trust and faith on the Afghan National Security Forces. Um, Afghans, uh, they have faith on their security forces. They believe that these forces uh, are depending the people from the terror, from the evil. And at the same time, it's not only the Afghans who are trusting the Afghan National Security Forces. The world today, the U.S., the United States, is having faith on the Afghan forces. The reason they are supporting the reason they are equipping the Afghan National Security Forces, especially the Afghan Air Force, uh, the new uh, Super Tucanos, uh, the Black Hawks for the Afghan Army, those are signs of faith in the Afghan Army, and, and it means that we are capable to, to, to defend this country at the same time. People who are joining the army in this country, it's not because of the wages. It's not because of the 200 US dollar they are getting paid on a monthly basis. It's because of this faith in the future in their country and this faith that they are the ones who have to be protecting their people. I am not sure if I heard all the words uh, 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 he said, but uh, I, I heard all the words from uh, Ambassador Samad. Uh, but I didn't hear all what the other guest said. Uh, uh, but I believe, and the Afghans believe, and the world believes that the Afghan National Security Forces can depend on their own in, in the last three years from 2014 uh, as a P8. Uh, they proved that they are capable of depending their people, their country. What is needed is the support from the international community. What is needed is that these forces have to be well equipped to make sure that we achieve our common goal to eliminate terrorism from Afghanistan. And this common goal is between Afghanistan and the world, not only our goal to achieve.
Well, Omar Sabat, let me ask you, how's the morale within the Afghan uh, National Security Forces? The morale, uh, I think, goes up and down depending on what is happening uh, on the ground. Uh, lately, we, uh, we, as your report also indicated, we have seen a spate of uh, very bloody attacks, and it is targeting uh, army, uh, police, uh, and other security forces in Afghanistan, trying to penetrate as deeply as possible. This, this points to a problem that, to some extent, uh, justifies uh, some of the issues that were brought up by Mr. Galbraith, uh, that uh, there is a uh, dysfunction at some level. Now, I, I am not sure if the level is the lower level where the local administrator is not doing a proper job, but the local administrator has to be appointed by someone, and then that person has to be appointed by somebody else. So it goes up all the way to leadership, and it goes back all the way to good management, uh, and making sure that you are able to have the right people doing the job that they are supposed to be doing, whether it's on the civilian side or on the military and police side. Uh, for that, I believe that we have done, we have had a lot of progress. We are showing, uh, you know, progress across the board, especially with the special forces of Afghanistan. They, there is now a plan to double those numbers because they have been so effective in fighting terrorism. But. Special forces are not going to do all the work that is needed. Obviously, we need to go to the local level. And at the local level, we need to make sure that we offer better governance, uh, better management, less corruption, uh, and more functionality, uh, and making sure that the average Afghan and the population is connected to the government and feels that the government, whether they are civilian or military, is there to protect them, is there to serve them, and that there's accountability. If President Donald Trump has campaigned on America first, how does one tackle this? Uh, Afghanistan is a very decentralized country, uh, very diverse, uh, one of the most diverse in the world, both ethnically and geographically. I mean, there are big mountains that uh, divide up the country. And yet, it has a highly centralized constitution. Centralized in the sense that all power is concentrated in Kabul, uh, uh, and so that all those people he was describing uh, uh, being appointed are uh, uh, ultimately appointed by the president of Afghanistan, by, by one person. Uh, and within uh, Kabul, much power is, is uh, concentrated in the hand of the presidency rather than a parliament, which really would represent the ethnic diversity of, of Afghanistan. Uh, and so there's, there has been a crisis of legitimacy. Uh, and there have been a series of um, elections that were characterized by very significant fraud. Now, in both uh, Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah, and I, I know both men well, there's really a, a pair of very competent, committed, leaders and, and a very welcome change from Hamid Karzai, who certainly by the end had become quite erratic. Uh, but that said, uh, this arrangement that they have of a, of a president and a chief executive was a result of a, an election that was characterized by fraud and not accepted by, by a significant part of the Afghan population. So th there, there, there needs to be some way that's going to give greater legitimacy to the government and then also you know, filtering down to, to be able to provide uh, uh, honest administration. Javid Faisal, I want to get back to this topic of these ghost fighters. Uh, just talk to us uh, about some of the reasons why some of these are going uh, missing. Is it payment? Is it family obligations? Why is this such uh, uh, an increasing problem? As I said earlier, uh, this problem is uh, uh, more in the number of people who are getting trained out of Afghanistan. And that number is not very big. Uh, forces who are getting trained locally or in the Afghan training uh, centers here in Afghanistan, we don't have much of that bigger attrition rate. Uh, but, but then that's, uh, uh, in the same time, uh, it's not a problem only with Afghans, it's, it's all over the places. You see people all around the globe who are fleeing elsewhere in the West 
or in, uh, in, in Europe. In the same time, many are returning back to this country. We have had people, refugees who went to uh, Europe, but now they are voluntarily coming back to Afghanistan. And there is a big number of them who are joining the Afghan National uh, Security Forces. So these are the good stories. But inside Afghanistan, uh, we don't have much of those cases. The people who are getting trained here locally, they are willing to sacrifice for their country. They are joining the army because they, they know they know what they are going to be facing. They see the casualty numbers. They are seeing the, the incidents, and they are witnessing all of the situation in this country. But they still decide to join the army and protect their people. That's something that continues. And uh, it's not uh, uh, much uh, uh, a bigger concern. Peter Gerberth, let's come back to this, uh, this, uh, these ghost fighters, the ones that were trained in the United States. Um, where are they? Where do they end up? Do they stay in the United States? Do they go back uh, to Afghanistan? And what is the U.S. doing to actually find them? Well, I, I think that uh, the overwhelming number of them, of course, go back to Afghanistan. Uh, now, these uh, uh, who are being trained in the United States are obviously not the ordinary soldiers. They're the, the officers. Uh, you know, there may be some number that seek uh, political asylum or claim it uh, uh, or simply disappear. And it's uh, not hard to disappear in the United States as a, a illegal uh, uh, immigrant. But uh, this is, um, I mean, it, it, it's a problem in the sense that, that this is a very expensive because these people have a, a huge investment's been made in them. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think that the problem of desertion in the uh, Afghan uh, National Security Forces is the, is the root of the problem of what's going on in Afghanistan. Uh, again, the root of the problem is the, is the durability of the Taliban. Uh, and first, it has to be said that uh, even in a country which uh, you know, was well run with a loyal security forces, uh, it, it's really very difficult, if not impossible, to protect everybody from terrorist attacks. So, I mean, how, how can you stop somebody from getting into a Shiite mosque and blowing themselves up? I mean, I, I don't think if we had that number of terrorists in, in, in the United States, uh, uh, you, one could be able to do it. Turkey has had experience with this kind of thing. So, the, you know, the, the challenge of providing security in a country where there is a, you know, there is still a significant insurgency, a significant number of terrorists, uh, is not. I mean, it's, very, it's extremely difficult to, and, if not impossible, to do. Uh, but I think the, the problems in Afghanistan are not primarily with the security forces, although there's some there. The, pro other, the larger problems are with the police, with corruption. Um, with the connections, uh, particularly in the Pashtun areas, between local administration and the Taliban, uh, with the you know with a level of corruption that's made it uh, difficult to improve the lives of ordinary Afghans. I'll give just one example. Uh, the U.S. government has spent billions building roads in Afghanistan to enable farmers to bring their uh, product to market, and so that they will no longer be subsistence farmers. But they don't do it because the police then check up, set up checkpoints, uh, and they collect so much from the farmers that it's not worth it to them to try to bring their product to market. That they're better off remaining subsistence farmers. Okay, Omar Samad. Peter talked about the durability of the insurgency. Is Afghanistan failing in its fight against the Taliban? No, I don't think so. I think that at the end of the day, it's those uh, Taliban and those who uh, manage uh, and operate the Taliban for proxy, regional, uh, geostrategic, geopolitical reasons inside and outside the country uh, who are failing. You know, the Taliban is a project that started almost 20 years ago. It hasn't really succeeded. But somehow, for some reason, those who are supporting it and promoting it uh, feel and think that it is succeeding. Uh, in the long run, it's going to fail. So the, pro the crux of the problem with security is the fact that we are faced with terrorism. It is, uh, security is threatened by mostly, uh, on one hand, terrorist elements, on the other hand, uh, criminal elements within the country and those who are benefiting one way or the other way, whether it's from smuggling, the drug issue, uh, arms running, 
uh, in all of this. And there's a nexus between all of these forces that exist as well. So that makes it more complicated. And the nexus goes beyond Afghanistan's borders, uh, where it's fed and also where most of the money is made. So if you look at it overall, I think that we need a strategy that really addresses all these components. But at the same time, the cracks, the middle, the core, has to do with dismantling uh, these sanctuaries, uh, these support networks that exist outside of Afghanistan, mainly in Pakistan. Now there are rumors, at least reports and uh, claims, that uh, other countries, maybe the Russians and others, are also contributing uh, for their own new reasons that have to do with Daesh and IS. So it's a complicated situation in Afghanistan. But to protect the Afghan people, we need to strengthen the Afghan forces. We need to make sure the Afghan government has more legitimate and also more effectiveness and is better uh, suited and, and uh, does a better job of governing. And at the same time, we need to fight terrorism where it comes from at, the, at its root. And the roots of terrorism that, that threatens Afghanistan are mainly outside the country. Peter, I want to turn back to you. You said that the Tal um, Omar mentioned uh, that it, the Taliban uh, is a project that will not succeed, has not succeeded, but they control large parts of the country. Uh, has the U.S. wasted its money here? Uh, also, going back to the example you gave about uh, the roads. Yes, the United States has wasted huge amounts of money in, in Afghanistan. Um, in part because uh, both in the Bush and early Obama administrations, uh, the United States substituted what it thought Afghanistan should look like for you know, what uh, uh, Afghans thought it should look like. Uh, and you know, uh, uh, interventions tend to work where the United States, where, where uh, the outside world, the uh, United States and others, support local parties in, uh, in their efforts. So, for example, uh, it worked quite well at the beginning when the U.S. supported the Northern Alliance to oust the Taliban. Uh, and and a, a lot of the aid that's been given has simply fueled the corruption and, and uh, created the networks that make uh, success uh, extremely difficult, if, if not, in, not impossible. Uh, you know, and, but on the other hand, the Taliban, they're not going to win. Uh, they're, the trouble is they're also not going to go away. Uh, they'll, they'll never take Kabul again, uh, but they can control large parts of the countryside. They control parts of Kandahar and some other cities during the night at different hours. Uh, and and that, that is the, the problem, and I guess ultimately it's going to require a negotiated solution. But that's going to be very difficult to achieve as well. Javid Faisal, I'm going to give you your final thoughts. Let me correct a few things. Uh, first, uh, Taliban do not control any area in Kandahar, neither in the city nor in the districts. Uh, in the same time, let me also correct that we, or the U.S., have not wasted money in Afghanistan. We might have wasted opportunities. Uh, we must have given up on some of our opportunities, but we did not waste the money here. Today, if I can talk from Kabul, it's the result of the investment the U.S. had in Afghanistan in the past 15 years. You couldn't speak a single word before this investment in this country. Today, the TV you have here, today, the young generation you have here, the schools you have here, the army you have here, the Air Force, the education, everything in this country is because of the investment of the U.S. and the world in this country. It was a very useful investment, and if it continues, we will be doing uh, much better. We will be a better country. Just one last word on uh, the U.S. first or the United States interests first. On this slogan, I would just like to say that if we are eliminating terrorism in Afghanistan, if the U.S. is investing on the Afghan forces to be capable to face threats on their own and, and destroy terrorism in this country, it's the interest of the United States, it's the interest of the world, and it can bring peace and stability not only to Afghanistan, but to the region and to the world. All right. Javid Faisal, Peter Gilbraith, and Omar Samad, thank you very much for joining us here on The Newsmakers.